Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the MedVod podcast. We are very excited to have Ido Sarig on the show. From VP in the technology strategy lead role at Mercury Interactive to multiple positions spent advising, mentoring, co-founding, and everything in between, to say Ido's career in tech has been illustrious is quite an understatement. Uh, Ido has been in the startup space, leading big ideas into long-term successes for three decades, and we are so happy to have him on the show. Ido, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, Clay. Awesome. Uh, all right. So I want to jump right in it, Ido. So right after university, you began your career at Mercury, which is where I want to spend most of our time today, actually. Um, when you started at Mercury, there was just a 12-person team looking for their big break. How did you help get Mercury to a $4.5 billion acquisition by HP? It seems like quite the leap. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to reframe your question a little bit so it doesn't appear like I did this four and a half billion dollar acquisition all by myself. I certainly played a part, a small part, um, but this was the culmination of basically a 17 year journey that involved hundreds of people um, all doing their part. And I did mine. So maybe I'll uh, reframe this as sort of how what I did initially at Mercury or how my role there evolved. And uh, I think by playing my part, uh, like we all did, that eventually led to this outcome. So um, Mercury was actually my first or almost first job straight out of college. Um, and uh, I actually tell a little anecdote here about how I got hired there, because I think there's a lesson to be learned from that as well. Um, sure. While I was still uh, going to school, my last year, uh, my senior year in college, I started working as a part-time student at a company called um, Daisy, uh, which was uh, also originally founded uh, by Arya Feingold, who was also the founder of Mercury. And I worked there, um, as I said, part-time, porting uh, some proprietary code to Spark stations. And since nobody there was actually uh, um, telling me that I was going to continue on there full-time once I graduated or making any um, uh, propositions to that effect. I was also uh, concurrently looking for other uh, jobs. I saw an ad in the paper that Mercury had put out and I started interviewing there. And I went to a series of interviews. Uh, Mercury at the time um, was, a relatively, it was a relatively new phenomenon in Israel. And we'll touch upon that later on in the conversation, I think. Um, but uh, the interviewing process there was uh, very lengthy, very rigorous, very difficult. That was, I think, the equivalent of what you would see today if you're interviewing for one of the uh, FANG companies, so it's very technical interviews with multiple sets of interviewees. And so, you know, I spent, I, I went to at least three or four of these, uh, each time meeting with different people and solving different puzzles for them. And then finally, they said, uh, we want you, um, but there's a catch. And the catch is, uh, I, as I said, Ari Feingold was the founder of both companies. He had a non-solicitation agreement with, uh, with Daisy, and I was a, a part-time Daisy employee. So they said, we can't hire you right now, but the non-solicitation expires in like a month and a half. So can you wait a month and a half? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I can't because I'm looking for a job. And coincidentally, I had at that same time been offered a permanent position with, uh, with Daisy Systems. So mm -hmm. I said no to Mercury and took the job with uh, Daisy, uh, only to have uh, that job completely disappear about two weeks later, because Daisy was already operating under Chapter 11 bankruptcy at the time, and it got oh. acquired. <laughs> it got acquired out of bankruptcy by Intergraph, and one of the first things that Intergraph did after the acquisition was shut down the Israeli R&D facility where I was working and send all the employees home. So. I'm on the phone immediately to uh, <laughs> Mercury say, hey, hey, I made a mistake here. Didn't mean to say no. Uh, and luckily for me, uh, they actually had me on. They, they knew this was coming down the pike and they had uh, prepared a list of potential DAISY employees that they would want to hire once the solicit non-solicitation agreement uh, expired or once DAISY went under and I was on that list. And all is well that ends well. And I think the lesson here is... Uh, without being too spiritual about it, is that oftentimes when one door closes, another one opens. And that was certainly the case for me. So I started out there, like I said, it was uh, like my first true job out of college. Um, mm -hmm. 
I started writing code. Initially, I wrote a, uh, we were using B-Trees as sort of like a database to hold um, various mouse tracks. We'll get into that in, in a minute. And that database would get corrupted sometimes. I had never worked on B-Trees before and never had any experience with databases at all, but I knew how to program in C. So I studied b and I wrote this recovery utility that would recover the database when needed. And then when that was done, I wrote a little uh, module that would do uh, bitmap comparisons uh, in mm -hmm. software. And that's related to Mercury's general idea that we'll discuss in detail. And then I moved into uh, UI design, first using open look and then using motif. And then I moved into uh, marketing. Um, Mercury, Mercury's culture, I think, is notable for uh, having been very open to promoting within and giving people within the company um, the opportunity to do things even beyond their existing expertise. And so when we were facing some challenges with our European organization and we reorganized that entire team uh, from sales on down, I was given the opportunity to uh, um, make use of the MBA that I'd meantime gotten and uh, run marketing for Mercury in Europe. And then later on, I moved with Mercury. Mercury moved me, relocated me to the US mm -hmm. to start what eventually became a new business unit for, uh, for Mercury in the application performance management uh, space, which I uh, basically started from a, a PowerPoint presentation and doing some uh, OEM deals with partners that helped us get into this space, into a, a full-fledged BU that I ran for a few years. And then ultimately there, I, uh, my last few years with Mercury, uh, I spent in corporate development, helping Mercury continue to grow this time inorganically through uh, mergers and acquisitions, where I was involved with about uh, six of those, uh, of those deals. Um, so overall, this, this spans, I think, uh, about 14 years. And you know, actually, when I left Mercury and uh, looked for other, uh, other jobs after Mercury, in the Silicon Valley, this was viewed as a, uh, as a negative. I, I kept being asked in job interviews questions to the effect of what was wrong with you? Why did you spend so much time with one company? Um, oh. Because in the, in the Valley, you know, it, it's quite often for people to, you know, spend two, three, maybe four years at a company and then move on to the next challenge. Sure. And you know, I, it got me thinking about why I did spend so much time with Mercury. And the answer is, I think, while it was always under the same umbrella of Mercury, it was essentially mm -hmm. a completely different company. When I started, I was employee number 12 in a very early stage startup. And then it became a, um, a fast growing company that dominated its, uh, its domain of automated software quality. And then it became a public company with multiple uh, product lines all related to testing. And then it became a multi-business unit, multinational company with testing tools and application performance management tools and IT governance tools. So it was a different company all along and I'm grateful to it for the opportunity that it gave me to uh, grow along with it. And you know, maybe um, just one final note on what part I played in the ultimate success of the company. I think, uh, and this is particularly relevant to your audience, I think, which is uh, made up mostly of uh, early stage entrepreneurs. It's important to realize that in an early stage company, you wear multiple hats and everybody does yeah. a little bit of everything. And so while I was certainly in engineering, I also did a bit of QA. We used to rotate engineers um, into customer support roles. Um, to help out, but also to get experience, firsthand experience with, with what it's like to use the product. And, you know, it's, it wasn't even unusual in those early days. Um, end of the quarter, uh, because of revenue recognition rules, you had to ship software before the end of the quarter for it to be recognized as a deal that you closed that quarter. So it wasn't odd to have an all hands event with everybody in the, uh, in the packing room, in the shipping dock packing CDs or before that magnetic tapes into uh, cardboard boxes and getting them on the shipping tr truck just so that we could recognize the revenue. And this was from the CEO on down. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it, I, I was going to say I, it, to me, it seems like a lot of the reason why maybe Mercury was a place you stayed so long was the, the sort of 
the expertise that you garnered in multiple aspects of the business, right? From starting as engineering to going into a more sort of marketing-based role, I'm sure that was exciting for you, um, being able to flex that muscle that you studied with uh, previously. Yeah, definitely, definitely was. Um, and again, it was part of the culture. It wasn't like uh, yeah. you got, you have a, a CS degree, so you're going to work in, in engineering or in QA and you have a, a marketing degree, so you're going to work in, in marketing or in sales. It was more like, you seem like a very talented person. Um, you've done very well in department X. Would you like to give, give us a hand in department Y because we're facing some challenges, opportunities all around. Yeah, and I, and that's the the sort of the benefit and the Achilles heel of startups, right? Where it's, you know, it's a lot of people have these great instances and then sometimes, you know, the the work gets a bit too much, but in, in Mercury's case, it, it seemed to work out. So um, it did, it did. And, and you're right. It often is a, uh, uh, a stumbling block. Um, I think a mm -hmm. lot of, uh, a lot of companies and a lot of uh, founders don't know when to make the switch and don't recognize where their right. own limitations are. And the guy who's right to, right to lead the company from idea stage to $5 million in revenue uh, might not be the same guy who is the right one to lead it to $50 million or to take it public. And you have to recognize your own limitations, You know, certainly give people the opportunity to try things, but also at the same time recognize when it's time to bring in some uh, outside help. Right. No. Oh, and speaking of that, so you were on the ground floor at Mercury. Uh, and as people know, right, this there was a huge acquisition in the early 2000s by HP uh, of the same company. And so you kind of were on that team to see it through. So uh, how did how did that work out? Yeah, it's an interesting story, actually. Um, so Mercury's original idea uh, was to automate the process of software testing specifically for, graph, for systems that use a graphical user interface and to do it in a totally non-intrusive manner. And I'll, I'll break this mm -hmm. down into, its, into three parts because uh, not all of them uh, worked out as well as we had anticipated. So I think the general idea of automating software quality for uh, uh, GUI systems was really an idea whose time has come, had, had come and we were in the right place at the right time. Um, graphical user interfaces were just uh, becoming popular and becoming successful uh, with things like the X Windows system, with things like early versions of Windows, and even before that, um, DOS applications that had a lot more graphics in them and you know primitive mouse activity of the day where you move the mouse between uh, textual cells. And a new paradigm was needed to test those systems. The older systems, which were primarily command line interfaces, you could easily test using um, textual data files that you would feed into the application. And the output mm -hmm. was also textual in nature. So you could do very easily do textual diffs and see if the, uh, the actual output matched the expected output. It was all very simple. But now you have GUI systems that you, you couldn't do that. You had to somehow simulate uh, input via mouse, you had to simulate, uh, you had to look at the output, which was often graphical in nature, and it wasn't very easy to see if this was the right output. So that idea certainly um, arrived at the right place at the right time. And in parallel, software systems were becoming increasingly more complex, more features, and tests and development cycles shortened considerably. So it was no longer feasible to do all that testing uh, manually. You had to automate them. So yeah. automating the testing of GUI systems was an idea, was a great idea. The non-intrusive part was not that great of an idea as it turned out. So it, it, the idea was basically that if you're going to test a system, you've got to do it completely from the outside. You can't be running software on the same computer that you're testing because running your own software, the testing software on the computer changes the system behavior, right? There's uh, additional context switches that have to happen between uh, the system under test and the system that you are testing with. Um, you're consuming memory, you're consuming other resources. From a purely uh, academic point of view, it is not correct to test uh, systems that way. Um, so we went about doing completely non-intrusive testing, meaning that in order to simulate 
uh, mouse activity for the purpose of testing, we mm -hmm. physically connected to the um, uh, to the wires that uh, connected the mouse to the computer, and we sent simulated electronic sim signals as if the mouse was doing it, but we sent it through our, our wire. And we did the same thing for the keyboard. And in order to compare the results, we read the contents of the memory chips that contained the uh, the the output, the the visual, the the memory sure. for the screen, because you know again you you don't want to do anything intrusive to do that. You don't want to run a a module that would capture a bitmap and compare it because you're running it on the screen. And that part didn't actually um, turn out to be uh, all that great. It has a lot of theoretical appeal, but it turns out that for most customers, the hassle. Uh, associated with that um, was not worth the, the the strict adherence to academic principles. Um, it was mm -hmm. only relevant for a very small, very narrow segment of the market. Um, military hardware uh, was one where this was very relevant. Um, embedded systems that were super time sensitive, um, it might have been relevant. But for the vast majority of customers, they couldn't care less. And in fact, that's what caused us to uh, to pivot away from that. Um, and it wasn't you know, it wasn't a single um, event that uh, gave us that aha moment. It was a, a series of events. The first sure. one was that um, uh, customers would balk at the way we approached it. So our sales engineering team would come into a customer with um, PC cards, hardware cards and alligator clips and screwdrivers and they'd proceed with the customer's permission of course to open up their the uh, cases of the computers that we're going to test and insert our cards and connect the alligator clips to the mouse wires and so on and it worked but people were like oh what are you doing here what are you um, doing right <laughs> so um that was you know, the initial reaction, um, this was uh, coupled with the fact that uh, Microsoft finally got it right with uh, version 3.1 of Windows. The previous ones were all very kludgy and not very popular, but with 3.1, suddenly Windows took off alongside on the Unix uh, uh, and the things X11 took off. And there was a lot of standardization. And we found out that Really, in practical terms, people didn't care about non-intrusiveness. They cared more about more about standardization. Don't mess up our QA lab. Just come in and run software on the system. We don't care if it's not 100% perfect. Um, and and then you know, if you are looking for a single event that caused the pivot, it's probably it's funny. But um, our first couple of customers, um, one was uh, Cytex, uh, a pioneer in. Uh, digital printing, and they were a very uh, friendly, very cooperative customer, gave us access to all the documentation of their proprietary hardware. So it was relatively easy for us to construct the needed hardware to simulate mouse and keyboard activity on that. Mm -hmm. And the second one was uh, Metaphor, also uh, turned out to be a very friendly customer. And then the third one, we had to do the same thing for an Apollo uh, workstation. Apollo, and most people don't even know this today, but it was uh, up predecessor to the engineering workstations that we know today that are made by Sun, it was eventually bought by HP. Um, we had a customer that had Apollo workstations and we couldn't get the thing working right for Apollo. And so as a workaround, and this is I think another lesson for, uh, for entrepreneurs, as a workaround, we said, you know what, there's a demo coming up in two weeks. We're not able to get the hardware to work to simulate uh, the input devices on that. Let's, uh, let's fake it. Let's let's do it in software, uh, just so that we can do a let's so we can show and de so do the demo, demo of what it would look sure. like, and you know buy us some time, and by by the time we get the deal closed, we'll, we'll figure the hardware out. Yeah. And as I mentioned, that was one of the things early things that I I wrote. They said go and write a, a bitmap comparison tool that will compare the actual screen capture with the one that's on file, and it will do it on software. And everybody was telling me, you know, that try to make it um, as optimal as possible, so it will run fast enough so that it might be good enough for a demo. We know it's not a good enough solution. We'll have to do it in hardware because you can't do it fast enough in software. Um, turned out you can, um, but I bet <laughs> if you go into the, uh, into the code today, 
the comment that I put in there where it says something like, uh, let's optimize this later to do bitwise comparison versus uh, going byte by byte to optimize mm -hmm. for, C I bet that's still in there. Um, yeah. but, it but it taught us a lesson. Um, and, and the lesson was, um, you know what? Maybe this whole non-intrusive thing is not all it's cracked up to be. Maybe we can afford to be a little more intrusive um, and get the results that customers want. And you know, if we want to elaborate on that, as another example, I'll, I'll just kind of draw a distinction between wanting to do the right thing from a purely academic or theoretical perspective and, and practical solutions. One of the early things that one of the features that was in the early product was the ability to do um, OCR basically, textual recognition. Many of these systems output mm -hmm. text onto the screen, but they would output them um, you know, into a graphical screen. Sure. So we, um, we went out and we studied the uh, uh, scientific literature and there were a lot of papers coming out at the time about how to, do, how to best do OCRs with things like and, invariant, invariant moments and so on. And um, Ido, um, when was this? Roughly. This this is uh, we're talking 1990, I think maybe 1991. Uh, okay. Okay. And uh, and so you know we we um, we had very uh, very clever guys on our team. They they read the papers. They implemented the algorithms and software, and we had a very um, uh, cumbersome system for doing OCR on screen, where you would have to teach the system the fonts. And the more fonts you taught it, the more confused it would get because there are many similar fonts. Mm. Um, and it worked like, um, I, don't know, I don't know, 85% of the time after you spent a lot of time teaching it. And honestly, customers didn't care. They said, why don't you just read the, there's a system function that writes this textual output to the screen. Why don't you just read the textual output off of the system function? If the system function is not working properly and causing graphical artifacts, We've got a right. bigger problem than, than being purely <laughs> non-intrusive. So th that, that was the pivot that we made. Um, the pivot was um, basically, let's drop the non-intrusive elements. Let's focus on a software-only solution that would work for standard systems. Windows uh, 3.1 on the Windows side, the X11 Windows system for Unix. And then later mm -hmm. on, we also dabbled a bit in uh, OS2 and Mac OS. But uh, I think, you know, OS2 never took off yeah. as, a, as a system for business. So, we, we didn't care about that. And Mac OS, you know, it, it, it wasn't really a business ready system in those days. Right, right. And so, I was, right, this, this pivot comes out of non-intrusive. Um, and how were the initial sort of uh, months or years, if you will, coming off of this pivot? Where did uh, Mercury sort of lead itself towards after that, after that pivot? Uh, different yeah. companies, different solutions, stuff like that. Sure. So, no, as I said, um, and, and I think it, it, uh, it's interesting to follow our path here and compare it with what uh, Jeffrey Moore uh, outlines in his uh, uh, seminal work, Crossing the Chasm, about mm -hmm. what it takes to successfully go from being an early stage uh, company whose technology is adopted by a few technology visionaries into becoming a, a mainstream solution. So our early customers, as I said, they had uh, proprietary hardware. Cytex had, it, had its own proprietary high-end digital printing system. Um, Metaphor, similarly, was a very uh, cutting-edge company with proprietary hardware, uh, a workstation designed by Ideo. And they, no, we're talking 1990, early 1990s, they already had wireless keyboards and wireless mice and what have you. Um, and because they were technology visionaries, they quickly recognized the value of our technology and they were quick to adopt it. But because they were in these very niche markets, um, they really couldn't serve as a growth engine for us because they couldn't be good references for the early majority, the mainstream buyers. And I think one of the things that worked well for us is that um, we recognized the opportunity in standardized systems and we capitalized on it. So um, we continued to support those early customers. We eventually 
spun out this technology that was the, the non-intrusive part uh, with the physical hardware to simulate input devices. We spun it out as its own company called uh, Cronus Interactive, and they continued to support uh, those early customers, and they found a nice little niche for themselves in the area okay. of uh, point of sale terminals and other uh, proprietary embedded software. But we moved on. We moved on to mm -hmm. Uh, mainstream systems like Windows and X11, and we found uh, a good home, a good target customer in the form of financial services um, that were oh. doing a lot of computer-based um, uh, stuff. And we built the whole product for them. And building the whole product meant, you know, moving from our original Kluge installation programs into something that used standard install shield and building a professional services organization that could help them get the software installed and get started and eventually evolve that into uh, an organization that could build testing centers of excellence. And we built integrations with um, client server systems initially and uh, for generation uh, application generators and later on with ERP systems so that all their testing needs could be met. And then we added on um, additional testing tools to do load testing and additional tools to do uh, test management of the entire testing process. Um, and then, as I said, eventually uh, evolved into a, a multi-business unit company beyond just testing to do uh, performance management, to do IT uh, governance. Um, and, and that's really what got us the, the acceleration, the, the growth engine that, that we needed. And, you know, do you think there was a reason why the financial industry was more akin to this, uh, uh, to your pivot early on? Um, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the cynical one says is that's where the <laughs> money was. Uh, right? the, the, these, these companies um, had a lot of cash on hand, and right. they were uh, very willing to spend that on technology that gave them a competitive advantage. Uh, there are a lot of industries um, that are slow to move. I think financial services are one of the early adopters, so they saw this new technology, um, and they... Uh, adopted it. So that, that, that's kind of the, the, the second reason. So combination of having the money to, to invest in it and being uh, uh, ready to adopt uh, technologies. And, you know, conversely, um, later in my career, um, I, uh, I spent several years with, with Wind River and uh, Wind River sold uh, embedded software. And okay. uh, during the period of, uh, you know, uh, when in the Internet of Things Became, became a thing. A, a lot of companies were talking the talk of uh, getting on the bandwagon of Internet of Things and connecting this device and that device to the Internet. And it turns out that a lot of these industries are um, old world uh, technologies and they're there for a reason. It's, it's not as easy to get a company that is in the business of um, making uh, water heaters, uh, boilers, or uh, uh, right. Uh, or those types of things to, to adopt technology as quickly as financial services. So now, Ido, uh, with the process of a startup success such as this, uh, you have to have people early on trust the vision and are willing to help you sort of work through that. Uh, what did the fundraising process look like for Mercury? Sure. Um, so first of all, I think it was very different from what fundraising looks like today. And I also want to caveat and say that uh, when I started with Mercury, I started in the engineering organization. Um, I wasn't directly involved in any of the fundraising itself, but we did have a very open uh, corporate culture that shared what was going on as part of fundraising. So I, I do know a bit of the, of the details, um, even though I wasn't directly involved. Um, mm. And when I say it was a, a different world than it is today, I think it's something that uh, your audience might find a little bit hard to relate. When you look at... Um, uh, at the, the, the technology scene or the part that Israel plays in the technology scene today, it's, it's really phenomenal, right? I mean, um, right. there are so many Israeli startups, entire books have been written about the topic, you know, startup nation and what made Israel this uh, phenomena where uh, it has the, the third largest number of uh, NASDAQ traded companies own ranking just behind the U S and China. So, I mean, the U S is a $330 million, 330 million people 
country known for its technology uh, hotbeds like Silicon Valley. Uh, NASDAQ is in the US. And China, of course, is more than a billion people. And then here comes this country of 9 million people, just about. And it's the third rank there. So um, people are, are almost at a loss to explain how that happened. Um, but today, every major VC firm um, has either an Israeli-focused fund or they have a, an Israeli-based partner that focuses just on Israeli investments. That was certainly not the case. Um, in the late 80s when Mercury raised its first round and certainly played to our advantage was that the founder, um, Arya Feingold, was already a, mm -hmm. a very successful and very successful entrepreneur. He started Daisy. He saw Daisy through its IPO. It was uh, uh, several hundred million dollars uh, in sales. And then after uh, Daisy, he went on to found uh, Ready System. So he was a known commodity and, you know, uh, when you're a known commodity as a, as a as an entrepreneur, it's easier for you to uh, to raise money. So he actually went out, and this was before I joined. The seed round he raised was around five million dollars from investors who had previously backed him uh, at uh, at Daisy and at Ready, um, and liked his idea uh, about automating GUI testing. Uh, and with that initial money, uh, they built the first product and hired the first employees. And when I joined, um, I was, as I said, I was employee number 12. About uh, two years after that, we raised uh, what was, I think, the first uh, true institutional round. Um, it was from uh, H&Q, Hamburg and Quist, uh, and a few other investors, about $10 million in that round. So bringing the total to around $15, $16 million. And two years wow. after that, we already went public. So it was wow. really phenomenal in terms of the, the success that the company had enabling it to go um, from idea stage to having enough revenues uh, and enough track record to go public uh, on NASDAQ in a short amount of time, less, less than five years. I think today with a lot of the... Uh, uh, the regulatory environment has changed considerably um, sure. with uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. I think for first, many uh, many companies are hesitant to go public just because of the the added overhead uh, that's involved with uh, regulatory compliance. As a result, you have to have much more revenues before people will consider you as a serious uh, IPO candidate. I think a lot of the strategic buyers have become uh, more aggressive in recent years, and they're snapping up companies before they get a chance to, to IPO. Um, yeah. And for a lot of founders, it's, it's a much better outcome. Um, so, so they go down that route. But, you know, like I said, it was a different time. Um, yeah. So from 89, uh, when we started out, to 93, when we IPO'd, two rounds of financing, that was it. It's quite amazing. And so to me, it seems like investors saw the inherent value of trying to implement GUI testing very early on um, to be able to raise that type of funding so quickly. Uh, and in, in, such a, uh, in such a time where um, it, the process was very new, uh, I, I would imagine. Yeah, um, and you know, the VC names I mentioned, I think are not, not household names. Uh, uh, yeah. Cer certainly in the investment community, they're known, but they're not known to the extent that, you know, a Sequoia or an Excel uh, or a Kleiner Perkins is known today. Um, but as I said, uh, we, we were able to leverage the, the name recognition that uh, Feingold had and the idea. It was an idea whose time has come. Anybody who was doing software development at the time realized what a painful painful problem it was. And the other thing, you know, maybe a point worth mentioning here is um, a lot of the times things that are painful and that people are willing to pay money for are not the sexy things. Um, software testing is not, not, not a sexy discipline. Uh, when I, when, <laughs> I, when I was interviewing, when I was interviewing for Mercury, um, that was one of the things that kind of uh, gave me pause. You know, I, I wanted to work on, I came, I was out of college, right? The interesting stuff at the time, this was pre-internet days, but the interesting stuff at the time was um, artificial intelligence. Um, and that's what people wanted okay. to work on. No, nobody wants to work on uh, code that will test other people's code. But uh, <laughs> I, I want to write the code, not test the code. 
Um, right. But it was such a big problem that uh, people were willing to, to pay up. And, and that's another thing you should be looking for um, as you search for uh, product market fit. I think the best indicator of product market fit is how many people are willing to uh, line up and sign on the dotted line. And just telling you you've got a great product or you've got a great idea or I love this uh, concept is meaningless. I want to see money in the bank. Absolutely. And so after Mercury's IPO, how did, uh, if at all, um, did the sort of company culture shift uh, from sort of these humble beginnings to now you've IPO'd in just five years time uh, and are now valued very highly? What, what did that look like? So um, I think, again, this speaks to uh, how unique uh, Mercury culture was and uh, what a great school it was for me. Um, and what I say now might sound, you know, self-serving or uh, facetious, but, but it is true in that we um, uh, managed to preserve the culture of uh, the, the startup culture well into the days when we were far removed from being a startup. Um, mm. And it's not just platitudes. Um, yeah. We, uh, we continued to uh, keep people involved in what was going on at the company, a high level of transparency, uh, a culture of promoting from within, a culture of holding people accountable to what they were doing. Um, so, you know, uh, carrot and stick, the carrot being we're going to give you opportunities, the stick, we're going to hold you accountable. And so, you know, I, I don't want to pretend that when we were a uh, 1200 person public company. We were just like a startup, we weren't, but sure. we still, we were able to, I think, retain a lot of the qualities, uh, a lot of the uh, DNA of that smaller, uh, very agile, uh, very uh, quick to adapt company, even well after we were public and, and making hundreds of millions of dollars a year. I, this might, it's really interesting, and I and I, I want to um, I want to further this point, and we're kind of getting to this section of the podcast talking more about the entrepreneurship. Um, but do you think that for other companies, other startups who are in the process of or looking to IPO or even considering it at at all, uh, that trying to maintain that culture that they know so well, uh, that foundation, do you think that is applicable for every startup, or do you think it sort of depends? Ah, that's a difficult question to answer. I think um, I'd like to say that it's that it could be applicable to every uh, to every company. I don't think there was something unique about the say the the market that Mercury operated in or mm -hmm. the path that it followed that enabled it to do it. It just had that culture. Um, mm -hmm. And where it breaks down or where where it might not be applicable to every company is you know not every company has that kind of culture or is able to. Uh, to foster it, and that is something that you you either have or you don't. I, I don't believe in, in changing corporate DNA. It's uh, it's all about the DNA of the, the company is comes from the DNA of the people. And if you don't have the kind of people in the organization that can sustain that type of culture well beyond right. startup phase, then it's not going to happen for you. Yeah. No, I think that I think that reigns true. Um, and I also <clears throat> feel like there's a an approach in in entrepreneurship, uh, teaching in, in college and stuff to sort of uh, be constantly innovating and trying to promote the startup culture and in, in every aspect of the business. But I think sometimes it could get muddled, uh, you know, um, especially if it's unfamiliar, or, you know, not the way the company was moving in, in the beginning uh, when it started. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's very true. And the, the, the other question I have for you, Ido, that's, again, same on, uh, on the same vein where we are now, uh, if you were to have some phrases or philosophies, if you will, um, that you've sort of kept throughout your, your time in, in startup culture and startup life in Silicon Valley and, and beyond, uh, what would they be? Um, so as far as fundraising, I, I think one of the, uh, the mantras that Mercury operated on, uh, certainly in the early days, but also 
well, until we went public, of course. Actually, even mm. after we went public, it was that you raise money when you can, not when you need, or not when you when your uh, business plan says that you should. And uh-huh. um, that carries over, I think, into some other lessons that I learned later on uh, as a VC with uh, uh, some of our portfolio companies. Uh, accepting or rejecting uh, acquisition offers. I think it's the same principle. And the basic principle here is you never know what's around the bend, right? You might feel very confident nice. today in your trajectory. Sales are going great. The next product release uh, is just around the corner and then boom, uh, dot, dot com bubble uh, bursts and all your plans about developing solutions for online retailers, you might as well shelve them. Or, you know, maybe there's a, uh, a macroeconomic recession, like the one that hit us in 07 and 08, or maybe there's a you know, very opportune, uh, very timely now, COVID outbreak that uh, shuts yeah. everything down. So um, if you don't have that cushion in the bank, uh, you're out of luck. So it's, it's always good to have that, that cushion. Um, I'm no here that I'm not advocating raising um, too much money, but if say you've got an A round and a B round and, it, and it's oversubscribed, uh, think long and hard before saying no to those other investors. Sometimes it's, it's better to uh, take a little bit more and have that cushion for another 18 months. And certainly you don't wanna be in a position where you uh, go out and raise money when you really need to raise money uh, or else you're gonna go bust because uh, more likely than not, you're not going to raise it. You're not going to raise it on favorable terms. And like I said, it, it, you know, it, it carried over to my time as, as a VC. Um, we had a number of portfolio companies doing very well, getting um, decent acquisition offers from potential strategic buyers and saying no to them because hey, we're doing great, right? Well, why should we settle for uh, 200 million, 300 million, whatever, when if we continue to execute, Sure. Uh, we're going to sell for a billion, right? Well, the, the, if we continue that, that's a very big if on that, if we continue <laughs> to execute, especially when not everything is under your control. Um, if everything was under your control, it'd be a different story, but there's all sorts of external factors that impact your business um, that, that you don't want to be in that situation. Makes total sense. Uh, Ido, I, one final question before, before we go here with your experience kind of both in engineering foundations as well as sort of the business end, uh, would you have any tips of advice maybe for someone who is either a business person or an engineering person who has a great idea, but is not sure that they have the wherewithal per se to sort of manage one load over the other? Um, Any advice to get going? Yeah, uh, I actually have, I think, two different pieces of advice. The first one is um, it's very rare that one person has it all. Uh, the, uh, the technology uh, wherewithal, uh, the business acumen, the uh, interpersonal skills to uh, go out and raise money from, uh, from investors and make no mm-hmm. mistake, it is uh, as much about the chemistry that you have with your potential investors as it is about your, your ideas. Um, so the mm-hmm. first bit of advice is find somebody that you trust who complements your skill set. So if you're very good technologically, find a good business partner. If you've got a great business idea, but you don't know how to make it a reality, find a very good CTO. When you do that, um, everybody in the initial pool should be on equal footing. It's uh, I've seen several founders fall into this trap of, hey, it's my idea. And I spent two years building this prototype or whatever. Um, and now I'm bringing in a business person. So I should own you know, 80% of the company and you should own 20 or it should be 60, 40. Don't do that. Uh, when you're just starting out, everybody should be equal. Uh, that avoids a lot of problems down the road. Um, of course, you can't, it's not sustainable long-term, right? The, the next round of, uh, uh, of people that you hire, whether it's technical people or various executives, they're not gonna be on the same footing as the founders, but the founding team should generally be uh, on equal footing or very close to it. Um, the second tip is uh, don't be hesitant to share uh, share your idea and get constructive criticism over it. Uh, and don't go around trying to find people to NDAs about it. A lot of um, 
another trap that is very, very common is I've got this great idea. It's, it's a multi-million dollar idea. I'm not going to share it with anybody because they're going to steal my idea. Um, ideas by themselves are nearly worthless. It's all about execution. Uh, a good idea can turn into a multiplier of execution, um, but it's first and foremost about the execution. And if all you have is an idea that somebody can copy simply by hearing it, you don't have a whole lot. So um, certainly, certainly sign employees and contractors and what have you uh, to NDAs when, when they start working for you, but uh, going around hiding what you have uh, yeah. at, at, with the cost of not being able to get constructive uh, feedback about the idea, that that's, that's not a bad way to go. Yeah, it, it, it also seems like it would lead itself to um, a lot of yes men in your future if you don't really want to heed the criticism early on. Yep. Yeah. Well, Ido, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. I know you're a busy man. This was such a delightful <laughs> conversation. Um, My pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, you know, what projects are you currently working on and how can our viewers keep in touch with your next endeavor? Oh, sure. So I'm currently uh, the chief marketing officer at Indigo. That's Indigo with two Gs dot AI. And what Indigo has is a cloud solution that is purpose built for leaders and managers at every level uh, that helps them successfully execute on their top priorities. It keeps them focused on the 20% of things that will deliver 80% of the value to them. Um, it's a very famous Pareto principle ap applied to leadership yes. execution. Uh, it makes sure that they're constantly aligned uh, with their peers and with organizational uh, goals and priorities. And it connects their daily work to the broader corporate purpose, which is uh, a big, a big uh, theme today, uh, part of stakeholder capitalism. It's a big part of the, the G in ESG uh, metrics. How well mm -hmm. do you govern? How do you prevent employees from burning out? How do you uh, keep people motivated? And making sure that they see the connection between the particular task that they're doing today or this week or this month and the overall meaningful corporate purpose uh, is very important. And um, it's a framework that we created. It's called Return on Leadership, ROL for short. Um, and actually, I like that a lot. yeah, I, thank you. Um, that, that was done before my time. I don't want to take credit for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we recently used this framework, the, the ROL framework, to rank the leadership execution of America's uh, largest public companies. And we published this ranking uh, in partnership with uh, Fortune magazine. You uh, can either go to uh, their site or you can go to our site, indigo.ai slash ROL-100 to see the full ranking. And I'm betting that you would not uh, you would not guess who came out on the top spot. Oh, interesting. I will be sure to check that out afterwards. <laughs> and we will put uh, both your website and the Fortune magazine link in our description as well. So viewers can check it out straight away. That sounds uh, great. Perfect. Ido, thank you so much again. You take care and uh, I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon. Thank you very much, Clay. Take care. Thank you, Ido.